Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the Future of Retail Festival. Um, very excited to be kicking things off with our first conversation, uh, which is about the digital, the physical digital future of retail and hospitality. Uh, for our first talk of the day, uh, we're super excited to be joined by Stephen Douglas. Uh, Stephen is McDonald's International Design Senior Director. He's going to tell you a little bit more about his role uh, once he comes on screen. Um, we are also going to be joined by George Gottel, who is the founder of Uxus. Uh, they will be discussing the contactless future of retail and hospitality experiences and how digital will be the key to reimagining uh, the post-COVID world. So some of the topics that they're going to explore include changing consumer behaviors post-COVID. Um, we're going to hear about how digital experiences can help brands survive and flourish during the post-COVID transition, and uh, the role that hospitality will play in the retail and dining experience uh, within digital uh, spaces. So a very timely conversation and a great way to kick off the day. Um, excited to welcome George and Steven to the stage. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Stephen, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. We're the, Why don't, George, George, we are the warm-up act. <laughs> we are the warm-up act, Stephen. <laughs> well, I think today's audience is going to be very curious to hear a little bit about what you do uh, for such a uh, large and successful company, uh, a global icon. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what your job is and what you do at McDonald's. Okay, so um, try and keep things as simple and as brief as possible. Uh, my job has responsibility uh, for the deployment of design concepts, interior, exterior, public facing uh, experience concepts uh, for McDonald's in the international markets. And when I say international markets, that is me that means the markets that are outside of the US. So I have a colleague who is based in the US, uh, who is my equivalent for that market, um, a guy called Max Carmona. And between us, uh, we have principal responsibility for the, the creation of designs and solutions for implementation in the, in the public spaces you know, of our restaurants, using uh, agencies such as your own, George, um, but also for the benefit of others, I do have to say that, um, yes, there are other agencies that we work with as well. But George, let me hand back to you and say, okay, what would you like to say about yourself and about Oxus? <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Um, yes, well, I'm the uh, founder and uh, chief creative officer for Oxus. Oxus means you times us. And uh, just like what's happening here today, we love to work collaboratively with our clients. Um, McDonald's has been a longtime client of ours uh, now for many years. Uh, a great pleasure to work with Stephen and his team. And like he mentioned, there are many other agencies, obviously, that work uh, in tandem. But uh, we, uh, we enjoy working with Stephen tremendously. And that's why uh, I wanted to invite him today to talk a little bit about the future of uh, retail and hospitality, uh, what it means in the post-COVID world, uh, in particular, how digital plays into the physical space, this idea of digital, um, and what it means going forward, and uh, how, because of COVID, things have accelerated. So I guess the, the first question that everybody wants to know is like, you know, will the behaviors of consumers shift post-COVID? What, what is your perspective on that, Stephen? Uh, the, the very short answer would be yes, George. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd like to hear a little bit more. <laughs> uh, no, like, um, where do you start with this? I mean, the, 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 it is such a broad, broad question. Yeah. And the, the reason that I say that is because of the fact, you know, just even at lunchtime today, um, I was watching the television and there was an announcement by Boris Johnson about plans to, like, uh, rebuild the UK by investing in significant infrastructure, housing, et cetera, projects. And I'm not here to speak about politics at all, um, but off the back of you know, his announcements, he was being pushed by journalists um, 
with questions, you know, which were which were starting with the phrase, "Can you promise this?" and "Can you promise that?" and "Can you promise you know, the next thing?" And you know, as I say, leaving aside politics, at, at the moment you can't promise anything, a hundred percent, you know, as far as mm -hmm. the future is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by simple virtue of the fact that you know we're we're still in a highly dynamic and, and fluid situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, again, and I'm I'm going to try and answer your question, George. But you know, I think. We all need to recognize the reality of the situation. Um, I was watching another, I was watching a documentary last night um, on the, the experiences of nurses and doctors in Cremona, a town in northern Italy, you know, which was one of the first to, to enter into lockdown. And, you know, they were showing the horrors of what it is that, you know, people have been experiencing, you know, as patients, but also, you know, as people working in, in the health service. And, mm -hmm. you know, off the back of that, um, you know, some of the closing comments, you know, as they were starting to, to reopen the market again, you know, coming from the doctors and nurses was, you know, things are going back to normal, but at the same time, we haven't, like, um, we haven't solved the underlying problem here. You know, there's still a virus at large, you know, so anyone who says they can, you know, confidently predict the, the future with any degree of granularity, you know, like, um, I would like to give them my money for a lottery ticket. <laughs> but um, you know, putting all that aside, you know, I, I think that trying to be pragmatic about things, um, I think that definitely coming off the back of this, every, everyone's been exposed to social distancing limitations, you know, in some way, shape, or form, and for sure, those so social distancing limitations and restrictions, you know, are, are being lifted. Um, you know, from one country to the next. Um, I, I don't think that, well, I cannot help but feel that there's going to be a lasting impact from that. There may be, yeah. might, there may be, there may not be social distancing restrictions in place, but I think that we're going to move to a place where there is unease amongst the population about social proximity. You know, Absolutely. so like uh, people are going to be nervous, like naturally coming off the back of this and going yeah. back into the, you know, the environments that, 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 that they were accustomed to in the past. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, again, speaking from personal experience, um, li living in France, restaurants here, you know, have been reopened like uh, a couple of weeks now and, you know, going out. Yes, tables are positioned further apart in like uh, cafes and uh, you know, like, um, dine-in, dine-out establishments. But at the same time, the number of people that are in the restaurant does not, uh, like, is, is not at the levels that you would normally expect at this time of year. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, that there's just, there's a lingering nervousness at the moment. And I think that um, how long it takes to get over that, you know, is going to, significantly on its own play a part in like uh, how people will be behave after this. It's, Absolutely. It's I about rebuilding well, confidence. Yeah. And I, I mean, and to your point about rebuilding confidence, I mean, obviously digital plays a very important part in terms of that contactless uh, way of, of utilizing uh, food and beverage, shopping. I mean, the generations now cross generationally, I think people have been forced to use digital platforms because of exactly what you're talking about, this nervousness, this inability to go out and communicate and have contact in the physical world that, that digital um, has, because of the situation, been imposed on a group of people beyond just the digital natives that we normally talk about, the youth group. Uh, and, and now more than ever, people are more fluid and comfortable using digital technologies yeah. uh, to interface with purchases or experiences. And, and that kind of greater acceptance across a wider group, I think, also gives companies and brands opportunities to create new types of experiences that people wouldn't normally have used in the past, simply because now they're accustomed to using these digital technologies. So I think in, in that way, um, there's been a forced adaptation to digital um, that has been accelerated because of COVID. No, no doubt. Uh, like I, I was reading something uh, a couple of days ago, which like um, uh, reported that what had been seen was uh, 
acceleration and digital adoption, uh, five years acceleration of digital adoption in the space of five months. You know, and it, like it speaks volumes on its own, George, that, you know, aside from retail, like uh, so many people are conducting business. Yes. In the fashion that we're conducting it right at this moment. You know, yes. that was never, you know, that was never the norm in the past. You know, I think yeah. everyone, had been, everyone had been speaking for years about a little bit more like uh, in the way of home working, you know, a little yeah. bit more about using digital platforms. You know, like if there's one thing that's certain coming off the back of this, like uh, let's just say everybody's worked from everybody's, everybody who has been fortunate enough to like continue working, like uh, has probably found themselves working to a greater extent from home, you know, if originally the, the, they were office based. And, you know, that on its own has like uh, impacts, like uh, digital is a facilitator of that, you know, Absolutely. in the same way digital it can be, a, a, digital is a facilitator of working as much as it can be a, a facilitator of commerce and retail Absolutely. and the rest of it. Um, <laughs> sorry, George, on you go. No, I mean, I think that your point about that, um, you know, uh, this kind of combination of the, and, and that's why I like the word digital so much as an expression of this kind of new way of handling digitized experiences, because I do think that nowadays in particular, there's a fluidity of consumers to move from digital platforms into the physical world and that the application of digital platforms to physical world uh, you know, affects how we do everything. So business, uh, pleasure, uh, consumption, um, and that consumers, in particular, young people, are extremely fluid between the two. Um, this idea of, you know, that this is a digital experience and this is a physical experience for a lot of people who are accustomed to using digital, or we'll call them the digital natives, um, for them, there is no boundary that it is this kind of fluid, everything is one type of experience. Um, and therefore, I think this idea of digital, uh, a word that's combining the two is, is, is kind of an, a nice way to think about how this new kind of consumer behavior uh, will affect the market. Like uh, th this word digital, George, like yeah. it's, I hear it, and prior to hearing the word digital, all I had, in, or the first time I saw you using the word digital, all I had in my mind was the word fidget. Uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, how many non-native speakers there are, like, uh, on, on the call, but for me, like, fidget is something, it, it describes a condition of not being able to sit still, you know, because I, 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 it, it, like, condition of jumping from this into that. And on many levels, like uh, digital is a little bit of jumping from this to that, you know, because it is the merging of the two things. Absolutely. Uh, I think it allows people, and often, again, digital natives, younger people, I, my, my partner happens to be a millennial, um, you know, he'll be sitting having dinner, chatting with his friend. I mean, he's sitting having dinner in a restaurant with me, chatting with his friend on, you know, a, a platform. You know, it, it, everything for, for especially a certain generation, it's all the same. And I think that uh, this COVID situation has kind of broadened that base so that people, you know, of, a, of, a, of older generations who maybe are not digital natives, who've grown into using digital technologies, now are, are more accustomed than ever uh, to do that. Yeah. So, George, right. next, time, ne next time you're having dinner with them, maybe you can suggest that he stops fidgeting. You know, I try to do that and it's like, there's no point because it's actually not even rude because his friends are also doing it as well. I'm the rude one who happens to be present, you know, <laughs> and yeah. not engaging. <laughs> no, but like, uh, like bringing things back, you know, the, the piece, the, there's no doubt there's going to be a change. Like uh, that's the only thing that, you know, that can be promised. Tomorrow is going to be different from today, which is going to be different from yesterday. Um, but also we need to recognize that, you know, a lot of what it is that we see is going to be driven by, you know, what happens in broader society. I mean, what happens uh, when people truly go back to using public transport again, you know, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. what happens when there are major public events, you know, allowed again, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's going to be the, the outcome from schools resuming? You know, the schools started back in France a week past uh, a week past yesterday, 
Yeah. Now, admittedly, a very short period before shutting it down again for like uh, for summer holidays, you know. But schools went back in France last week. You know, what's going to be the outcome from that over the long ter longer term? Uh, you know, playgrounds as well. You know, for kids, all of these things are going to feed into, let's just say, the way retail has to work, the way that we live our lives. And yeah. you know, I, again, without getting sort of like too off too off track, I mean, I think that one thing that the whole experience here has shown is like uh, how closely interconnected um, all of the pieces of society actually are and how actually well oiled a machine, you know, it was that we were actually living in on many levels, despite all the fault. You know, when kids can't go to school, it has an effect when like uh, we have a challenge as far as like uh, occupancy of public transport, it has an effect. You know? So. Every, everywhere you look, there are yeah, there are societal things that are that are going to affect. You know, there are behavioural things. There can be regulatory things. You know, off the back of it as well. And by regulation, you know, we, we should not lose sight of the fact that you know, at the heart of all of this, you know, like truly, there's a, there, there's a virus. And off the back of the virus, it means that hygiene and safety. Has got to be has got to be top of the agenda, you know, for, for everyone. And I, I can't help but feel that after 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 such a public health uh, scare on a global level, you know, we will see regulation dictating, you know, changes as far as hygiene is concerned. Maybe not just as far as personal hygiene is concerned, you know, but potentially for like food hygiene. Goodness knows what I think that. The fallout from a regulation side of things, not necessarily, I don't mean the fallout, the results or the outcomes, you know, uh, from, a, from a public health uh, and regulatory side of things can, could be equally as significant. Um, so I think you, you bring up a very good point of, um, you know, the idea of companies being transparent and giving that confidence back to the consumer, you know, um, this idea that. Uh, you know, health and safety and hygiene play a very critical role. Uh, again, this idea of transparency was already starting prior to the COVID situation. There were a lot of companies who were talking about uh, their profit margins on products that people could buy online and, and all kinds of things. And now I think in particular, uh, this idea of companies being able to, to show their customers, you know, how safe their products are. And more importantly, in the world of food and beverage, um, that the hygiene aspect is, you know, of the highest standard. I think definitely those are going to be huge changes that we're going to see in terms of impact on the market. Um, how do you think this is going to impact the market, Stephen? What, like in particular for McDonald's, what, what sort of um, things do you see happening there? Um, obviously, you know, you're one of the leaders in digital, in digital ordering systems. Um, so, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about this idea of cashless transactions and how they yeah. are going forward? Like, um, okay, I, I, a couple of things coming off the back of that. You know, obviously off off the back of everything that's that's been happening here, um, one of the, one of the, one of the streams, one of the channels, you know, that we are serving, you know, like uh, has obviously served as great benefit, most specifically drive-through. Like uh, the fact that we have, have got drive-through there as, as a channel, um, has allowed us to, to perform where others have been unable to perform. Now, you know, by its nature, perhaps at the beginning, like uh, digital uh, drive-through was perhaps more of a, a low-tech digital experience where like uh, you were speaking to somebody through a speaker post. Uh, but, you know, off the back of that, it obviously allows like a degree of, you know, physical separation. Now, yes, we're adding more technology and the way of digital menu boards into drive-throughs, et cetera. But at the foundation, you know, we drive drive-through has been great for us as a business. Um, back in a uh, 2017, we started a more concerted journey as far as delivery is concerned. We had been operating what we called McDonald's delivery service in a number of markets for a, for a number of years. Um, and at the start of 2017, uh, we opened the, the door and started working with third party operators in terms of, you know, affording 
uh, our uh, food offering, you know, through their platforms. Um, and quite frankly, I, again, an even more digital experience than we were accustomed to in the past. Uh, one that's perhaps even more contactless and one that off the back of this, when people are self-isolating at home, you know, gives, a, gives them an opportunity to, to access you know, like uh, our, our offering. And, you know, within the restaurant environment itself, you know, over the years, I'm sure in common with every other business, we have seen rise in uh, contactless payment you know, methodology. And with, with us, like uh, we've seen the same as well. And that has obviously continued uh, through the, the, the COVID scenario. Uh, and one of the other things, you know, in the equation, and it's a question that comes by quite a lot was, we were probably one of the, the, the first QSR brands to go seriously after self-order kiosks as a means of ordering you know, in the restaurant. Um, and you know, one of the, the common questions that comes around or common presumptions that goes around at the moment is that you know, this pandemic is going to be like uh, the death knell for self-order kiosks. And uh, going back, I, I can't read tea leaves, but what I can say is that what we have seen in some markets is in terms of the percentage of transactions taking place in the restaurant, we have seen in percentage terms a number of orders being placed on kiosk increasing compared to those being placed at front counter. Hmm. Now, for many people, that's obviously a surprise because this, well, like, how, how can that be? But you know, when you analyze it going you know, from, the, from the other side of things, and obviously you try to anticipate what customers are thinking in leading them to act the way that they're acting. You know, there can be a couple of things on that. One, it could be that at some level, a customer is more comfortable to place an order on a kiosk than placing an order face to face with a person because it could be perceived that there's a greater risk of person being uh, infected than perhaps a kiosk screen, particularly if you're taking care to have a strong uh, regime in place as far as cleaning is concerned. The other piece of the equation is that like, uh, typically we've been placing kiosks away from the counter area, you know, which can conceivably mean that when they're removed from the counter area, you're not surrounded by as many people in the overall ordering process. Uh, well, when we first in, introduced kiosks, like uh, we started in Europe in, with kiosks in France, actually, around about 2005. Uh, and over the years, um, you know, starting from there, uh, they were deployed in other markets. And at certain points, you know, people were saying, you know, at a certain point, these things are going to replace kiosks. Um, you know, back as far as 2010, you know, questions were like being asked, why should we invest in kiosks when everyone's going to move to digital? Um, uh, we would not have had the uptick in terms of digital engagement that we have seen overall if we hadn't, if we hadn't had kiosks. Now, you can then analyze why would that be the case at McDonald's? Is that different from other retailers? You know, I would say that one of our reputations, George, like has obviously been over the years for offering speed and convenience. Yeah. You know, is it apart from perhaps being more convenient? At a certain point, you need to stop to use that yeah. unless you're always ordering on favorites. You know, so if you're going to the restaurant, at a certain point, you need to, you need to perform the action. And I do think that for some people. Like um, and I again, I can only anticipate and not speak with speak with factual certainty. Um, mm -hmm. But for a number of people, they might say, you know what, it's just as easy to go to McDonald's, place an order on, on the screen, and then go and enjoy table service, as opposed to putting something else into the equation that uh, can just as readily be done by the time I, I get to the, the store. Yeah, I think I think what you're talking about is a really great example of this digital experience, right? It's a combination of the two things, both the physical in restaurant yeah. experience, in addition to this digital component. I totally get why someone would be more comfortable ordering on a kiosk because it's easy just to do hand sanitizer after you've touched the screen versus standing in front of someone who may contaminate you. Not that any of the workers at McDonald's, any of the service people at McDonald's 
would be um, sick, but you know, there is that when you are feeling insecure, any, any amount of kind of distancing feels better. Yeah. So that, that would make a lot of sense. Um, like, sorry, George, just coming back to one point there, like um, yeah. you mentioned about the staff and in, in our language, you know, the crew that are working in the restaurant. Yeah. This is one thing that we must not lose sight of. That's one group we cannot afford to lose sight of, you know, in, yeah. in this whole equation. Because, you know, hygiene and safety for customers um, yeah. has got to play across to staff as well. Absolutely. And, and also, you know, at the foundation of any experience that it is that I think that you're delivering for the for the customer, it, it is... It's got to be convenient and easy and experiential for them. But on the other hand, for the staff member, it's got to be convenient and easy for them too. You know, so I, I think that we always need to look at the business from both sides of the equation, what it is that we are doing to serve the customer and what it is that the customer's expectations are uh, and trying to find a way within each of the business to marry those things. I think that's a very key insight that you just brought up that uh, potentially other sectors don't pay as much attention to, um, you know, the, the actual employee of the company and how they service the customer is as important as the service itself and, and the, the consumer interface. Um, their well-being, um, you know, the personnel of the company, their well-being uh, is directly related to the well-being of the company itself. So I, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, how do you feel about what is happening in terms of the environment, the interior environment of restaurants going forward, how COVID will uh, affect at least uh, right now temporarily, obviously once this pandemic um, is over, quote unquote, um, obviously things will change again. But um, for now, what do you see as being one of the key aspects of interiors for restaurants and, and potentially retail stores? Um. I think occupancy is the occupancy levels is probably mm -hmm. one of the ones that's top of like many people's minds on this. Like mm -hmm. uh, nobody knows, you know, the answers to so many questions. Um, you know, and I think like everyone else, you know, we're trying to make sure that we take the best insight and in every situation, you know, like a uh, apply regulations that are in place you know, in the different markets that it is that, that, that we're operating in. You know, I, I go back to occupancy levels because no matter which way you look at it, it has an effect, you know, on, for us, our dining areas and the number mm -hmm. of people that we're able to accommodate. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, beyond that, you sort yeah. of say, okay, beyond distancing, you know, like uh, you, you get into, you know, discussions about like, what, what about the ventilation rates in the place? You know, what, what yeah. about like, uh, you know, the touch surfaces? What about, you know, communication of like uh, what it is you're doing to, to guests? You know, uh, those kind of things need to be played out in the environment. Yeah. Um, you know, but at, at the end, the, the steps that need to be taken are really going to have to be there to like, protect people from one another yeah um, and like uh, that that's where fundamentally uh, we've all got to focus and oh i know you know, just for example i'm gonna i'm gonna pick yeah. up on one george and okay maybe Great. like a, a few people on the call have you know ha had some similar experiences to me um you know which is you know over recent months you know one of the one of the groups that's been knocking at my doors more frequently have been yeah. people who are selling like uh, antimicrobial products. Um, and yeah, like, uh, off the back of that, you say to yourself, okay, the, by the very wording of it, you say to yourself, it's an opportunity to go after. Um, I think that yes, there are opportunities there, but what needs to be recognized before jumping to conclusions too quickly is that an antimicrobial surface does not remove the need to keep that surface clean. So, for example, and I'm just playing it out because like, uh, it was a personal experience. If you have a soiled finger like, uh, and it touches any surface, 
Yeah. Uh, antimic antimicrobial products do not kill on contact. You know, so at a certain point, whatever it is that is there, you know, like it does like carry risk. So that's where at the moment, in terms of the way that we play out, you know, like uh, things within our, our dining areas and within the broader retail space, you know, the, 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 the guidance coming from everywhere has got to relate to like uh, keeping yourself clean, washing your hands and so keeping a respectful distance from other people. You know, and in yeah. physical space, you know, that's going to like uh, those are going to be the impacts on dining areas. Uh, yeah. How they transcend over time, you know, I think in large part will be through seeing how people react to those dynamics. Um, but also, uh, th there is a piece that you sort of say at a certain point, maybe some things will be driven by herd mentality. You know, like I say, herd mentality. Yeah. Because what does that of the fact, yeah. Well, yeah. like it's just everyone follows like on something because sure. you see it as something is ha having to be done. And I'm just going to quote one example that I still don't understand today. Why did everyone go out and panic buy toilet rolls? I, <laughs> I, I still don't know. But something like that can come yeah. along and then suddenly like uh, the whole industry like uh, has to react to it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I mean... I think I think that you know that's a really good point that you bring up is that emotional aspect, right? So the irrational kind of emotive aspect of the experience, and you know what does that mean? You know how does how does a brand then give either a connection to the customer on that emotional level or reassure them emotionally? Because I think I don't think people rationally look at scientific facts when they go into a restaurant when they want to, you know, order something, they, they feel when something is not right, they have emotional insecurities, if, if something doesn't, you know, in the environment isn't aligned to their expectation. Yeah, but, think, but George, George, I also think that um, we're, we're going to see differences playing out across different countries. You know, in, in the same way, you know, like, uh, just even within a European context, you know, it yeah. can be quite interesting to see, you know, the reactions of, for example, people in Germany versus the reaction of people in countries with a, a higher infection rate. You know, and th th that's where at the moment, like uh, I mentioned the, the kiosk example a few minutes ago, and we, we have some markets that, there that are showing an increased percentage of transactions in store going through self order kiosks. Yeah. Similarly, because we're like in many cases like opening dining areas again, there there can be some markets where the reaction you know could be like different. And so yeah. I, I, at the moment, um, because of the fact that there have been different impacts like uh, in different countries, I think that we're going to see different reactions off the back of that yeah um, well i think that's a great insight you know that the cultural context of the experience of how COVID was handled in each country or the or the level of infection for each country will play a big role in how in how those people behave i noticed here even in amsterdam where i live that you know uh in here in holland um the there is no requirement to wear face masks in public uh, they do require the social distancing but what I did notice is that any Italian visitor that we do have here often is wearing a mask, regardless if no one around them is. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of the severity, obviously, of the situation in Italy and how you know dire it was there uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. So I think psychologically, these you know Italians just in their mind, yes, wear a mask. It's very important. Yeah. Um, going back to the whole, uh, you know. Uh, aspect of what the market is doing. I mean, how do you think that digital uh, will help brands survive and flourish after this post COVID? I mean, what do you think that, um, that, that, that the aspect of, of kind of integrating digital now in a meaningful way for the first time across the entire group of society, um, how do you think that's going to help brands? A, I, I, I think it's going to help brands because of the fact fundamentally, a, that channel is more contactless. Okay, so th that's that's the reality of it. You know, yeah. back to the comment I made a, you know, a few minutes ago, um, increasing distances between people, you know, and higher levels of hygiene um, are broadly quoted as being the things that will get us out of this. 
uh, digital digital experiences by their by their nature offer like a greater separation of people you know and off yeah. the back of that like uh, that that can certainly help but I, you know I, I want to reinforce you know again a point that um, you know I made a bit before which is that um, the convenience piece of the equation has got to be supported both by the digital experience yes. and by the experience that is being offered by the company. The two must coexist. You cannot have a convenient experience for one group without it being convenient for the others. And that, that is a really good point. So I think that a, a, lot, a big question out there right now that a lot of people are wondering about is how do we get people back? You know, there's a lot of digital sales right now happening. I mean, even, you know, you're talking about how McDonald's, the drive through experience has really grown uh, tremendously over the past few months. How do you think we're going to get people back into spaces? What do you think we will need to do? I mean, we, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, working remotely. Um, that is going to open up a lot of spaces that used to be full of employees. Now they're going to be empty office buildings everywhere. There's going to be a lot of people who are now accustomed to not shopping physically in a retail store or not going to a restaurant, having home delivery or pickup. Um, you know, what do you think we, what do you think brands need to do to, to attract consumers back into those spaces? Or do you think they need to, maybe they, those spaces don't need to exist anymore or they need to become something else. Um, that's like the sixty-four million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I've got sixty-four like, million right here waiting for you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, uh, may, maybe it's just me. Maybe, it, but like, uh, I'm sure that there will be others too. Um, the, the the piece about a uh, social activity. Like mm -hmm. uh, for me, or, and sociable like uh, ventures, mm -hmm. um, you know, is 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 important. Yeah. And you know, the re the reason I say that is that you know, like w w when you pair everything back, and again, sorry, I'm speaking more about things from my perspective than perhaps broader retail's perspective. But you know, eating together yes. is something that has been a social event since we emerged from caves, right? So one way or another, like a, I cannot help but feel that that, you know, is there to be sustained. How do you encourage people, you know, to do it, you know, away from home? That, that's, that, that, that's going to be the big, you know, challenge for, for everyone. Yeah. And you can say, okay, delivery plays a role and like a uh, drive through like uh, plays a role. So to your point, how do you get people back into the restaurants again? And um, how do you get people back into like uh, shops again? I, I, I think that for, for the time being, you know, we need to be, we need to be watching out for our guests. We need to be communicating to them what it is that we're doing. Um, but as importantly, doing what we say we're going to be doing, you know, in order to, to look after them. Um, I think that to encourage people in, like uh, hospitality is going to be perhaps more important, you know, the, than it's ever been. And, you know, maybe not just hospitality at the, so like, uh, the first level, maybe the role of hospitality has to evolve a bit, like um, as opposed well, to... Well, I think what you're saying, Stephen, is incredibly relevant. I mean, I think, you know, especially even for retail, it's a social activity when you're talking yeah. about going shopping in a physical space. I mean, anyone can order anything anywhere, anytime, you know, like you were saying, you know, the phone, you know, this is my everywhere store, right? And my everywhere restaurant. Yeah. So, you know, why the physical space? And I think that there's a natural uh, proclivity for people to come together in social groups and participate uh, with each other in, 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 you know, experiences, whether it's dining or shopping or, yeah. or whatever it might be. And, uh, I think that we need to, um, you know, really encourage the sense of community in those spaces and design and build spaces that help facilitate those social interactions, um, in a safe way. Um, yeah. We have a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, will the pandemic accelerate rollout of McDonald's to go format as seen in Fleet Street, London? 
Okay, uh, like I, 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 I can un, I can answer that one. Um, watch this space, like, uh, and, and the reason that I, I, the reason that I say that is, you know, we we opened that um, we opened that outlet on the thirtieth of July last year. It was on the, it was at the location, you know, of a, of a previous McDonald's, and we were looking at the, this concept of you know to go. Uh, with let's just say kiosk um, orientated ordering, um, I think it, it's a very interesting question, and I, and I can't actually answer the question one hundred percent because let's just say there's two pieces to the puzzle there. On the one hand, one can presume that something like that, off the back of the pandemic, uh, would be a beneficial platform to go after. On the other hand, and this is something that you know is related to, to our business model, um, we need to make sure that we're able to serve customers at mass. Okay, we need a significant throughput of customers because the, the per uh, unit profit um, you know, is, is, is not so great. And so that's where a small unit that does not accommodate a significant number of people could be the flip side you know, of the coin. And so that's where, you know, like, I, I, again, there are, there are two pieces, you know, to the equation here. One, the presumption, more contactless, more to go, and therefore, let's just say, more becoming to customers. On the other hand, the reality, um, you know, of like uh, what it is that we need to do to sustain our business model. I see there's another question. Uh, we're, we're, we are being asked to wrap up, so um, it looks like we have two more minutes. Um, Stephen, I, I want to I wanna thank you uh, for, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Insightful and inspiring as ever. Um, um, if anyone wants to reach UXUS, please go to UXUS.com, U-X-U-S.com, uh, and uh, if there's an info email there if you need to reach me for whatever reason. I'm also on Instagram, George uh, underscore Godel. So you can also send me a direct message uh, through Instagram if, if anyone has any more questions. Um, Stephen, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the session? Uh, no, I mean, George, uh, thank you very much for the conversation. It's been good fun. It's a pleasure yeah. as always, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, going to keep that, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep that word digital in my head. Okay, well, I, I disagree with your wife. I do think you look like George Clooney on the yeah, screen. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate everybody attending today, and I hope you found it exciting and insightful. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.
Could someone say something to make sure I can hear? Yep, we're here. Perfect, thanks. Yes.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about winning them back, the psychology behind retail redesign. Uh, and this whole group, there are four of them, are all joining us from London. So we're going to, get to hear the uh, London perspective. Um, cues, store bouncers, masks, temperature checks, stand here, stand there, don't touch anything, don't touch me. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty wild time and um, ensuring a sense of safety is necessary. Um, and we also need to, at the same time, be careful about designing experiences that make us, uh, that don't make us feel afraid or stressed out or out of control uh, for those that have um, ventured out and gone into sort of physical retail environments. Um, there's definitely a strange vibe out there. So during this talk, we're, we'll tap into the psychology um, to help us um, redesign stores that speak to our human needs at a subconscious level. Um, our moderator today is Sandy Hernandez. She's a retailing consumer trend spotter and strategist. Uh, she helps companies innovate um, their customer experiences to profitably drive brand love. Um, we're also joined by Kate Nightingale. Kate is a customer psychologist and a human brands expert. She's also the founder of Style Psychology Limited, a uh, human experience consultancy with a twist. We're going to be joined by Ian Johnston. He's the founder of Quinine. Um, a leading retail experience consultancy devoted to the power of design to drive innovation and growth. And finally, we are joined by Anthony Tasgal. Anthony runs his own training company and is course director for the Chartered Institute of Marketing, the Market Research Society, the Institute of Internal, Communi Internal Communication, and quite a few more. I'll let him, I'll let him expound on that. Um, but yeah, so we're really excited to have everyone and I'm excited to uh, give the stage to everyone. Um, Sandy, you are up. Hello, everyone. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, so thanks, Jeff. So my name is Sandy Hernandez, as, as Jeff kindly introduced all of us. Um, so during this talk live from London, we're going to tap into the world of psychology to help you do three things. Um, number one is um, empathize with what your customers and employees are feeling, anticipate what they'll need and desire and predict how they will act in the coming months. And number two, we're going to learn from retail reopening strategies that are working well and not so well. And lastly, number three, we're going to get inspired to design spaces and experiences that stand out and that win back your customers. So I don't see, are you, the other panelists on? Just if you put your videos on, that would be great. Hi. So great. Hi. So we have Kate, Taz, and Ian as well. Great. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I think firstly, we're going to just start by stepping into the mind of the consumer, the, the human. So as people and as a society, we've definitely been on an emotional journey during the pandemic. So I'd like to start with Kate. Um, where are we now as, as human beings, as customers, at, as stores and the economy start to reopen? What are people feeling now? What psychological needs and desires are we craving? So um, first, we need to kind of understand that we all obviously went through an extreme uh, sort of wave of uh, emotions, and uh, that also forced majority of human population to do heavy introspection uh, on what is truly important and uh, what they want. And another thing that uh, has been uh, strongly forbidden for us is control over our lives. Um, so that obviously is going to be heavily manifested in any kind of consumer behavior right now. And uh, the next thing was the aspect of uh, reduction of feeling of belongingness, because um, obviously we weren't able to con um, sort of contact um, as much as we want, or at least in a more visceral manner, uh, our families and friends. So what we have been obviously seeing with the uh, with the impact of um, you know of the existential threat is that we have sort of two ways of moving um, our behavior. It's either we become more indulgent and impulsive, and this is, for example, what we have 
uh, seen um, great thing that everyone was very shocked about. The, or was it, I think, 2.7 million uh, sales to Hermes in the first day when they've opened in China? That's the example of it. But that's also the example of that sensation of freedom and an ability to be able to control some part of my life. And then the second level is be moral uh, and pro-social. Uh, that also includes sustainability and local consumption, which obviously has um, sort of increased. Um, but one thing that, um, you know, that we obviously kind of were also very much missing is that excitement and entertainment and fun and sensory stimulation and, you know, that kind of social impact and the things that are truly different um, because everything was the same, the same room, the same wall as like boring, basically. So we're really going to heavily need differentiation and you know, and that's something that retailers are going to have to really think about on how we're going to do that, especially that we have a much higher uh, threshold of accepting change. So those are just lots of those things, as you can see in that matrix, and that's still a very minuscule amount of what's going on in our heads. Mm -hmm. so, so Taz, you come from a, um, a slightly different background as well with just behavioral economics, behavioral science. I guess, what's your view on where we are as, as customers, as human beings? Yeah, I think given that we've got a panel for whom probably we're all gonna be violently agreeing, um, let me just take a slightly different attack because I, I, I endorse most of everything that, that Kay said. As you say, I come from a sort of behavioral economics storytelling background. Also, I'm used to working as an advertising agency planner with brands, positioning, communications. And I think for me, I, I talk about climbing Mount Maslow. So if we go to Maslow's, we, we shouldn't call it a pyramid, by the way, because it's two dimensions. It's just a triangle. Right. But everyone, in, particularly everyone in advertising, likes to add depth to everything. So I'll say it's a pyramid but it's a triangle. So I think what's happened is that we've slid down the last three or four months. We've all, as a, as a, as a species really, we slid down to the bottom of that, of that uh, triangle, which was all about safety and security and physiological needs. And I think what we're all now trying to do is work out how we climb to the top of that pyramid, that triangle again. And for me at the time, I didn't like self-actualization. It's a bit too sort of young really. And I think maybe a bit too early in the morning for a lot of you to talk about Carl Jung. So the word that I like using is meaning. I think what people want in life is meaning. Um, they want to understand how they fit into the world, as, as Kate said, how they can have control or agency. So for me, a lot of this meaning comes from community. And I think what retail has got to do is got to go back to some of those values that stores and communities and high streets were all about about belonging, about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. I often use a definition of a brand. A brand for me is a tribe of shared meaning. So I think a lot of retail stores and beyond retail, frankly, have got to understand what those shared meanings are and understand how they can link into that sense of community to bring us all out and enjoy a greater sense of meaning as individuals, as a society. Great. So, and, and Ian, so what else are you observing um, of, of needs that perhaps we haven't addressed so far? I mean, it's really interesting. Both Kate and Taz, um, you know, captured, captured a lot there. And I agree with all of them. I mean, the one thing I notice is this kind of uh, duality, right? We're playing with kind of two opposing um, forces within and, and from 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 outside, you know, and I think that duality exists in many situations. And for me, that's that dilemma that I have, you know, do I have the, do I have the, the, the virus or do I want to spread the virus, you know, whereas I want to be quite selfish or do I want to be quite, you know, focused on society and this kind of duality that we play with um, internally. And I guess the thing I'm starting to recognize personally, and I see it, um, I think we all have those challenges and those those moments, right? Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? Do I social distance? Do I stop most? Do I not social distance? Like this, this kind of duality is playing out in, in every scenario. I'm having this dilemma within an internal dilemma and I'm questioning everything. And I think the thing I, I recognize the most is, is it's actually okay to have that dilemma, right? We're, we're actually, I think everyone is going through that, that same place all the time. And um, once you start to recognize that that questions, those questions you're asking yourself, you know, you can kind of start to sit at ease. Everyone is going through those same kinds of 
dilemmas and questions um, from within. You know, I, I have a very optimistic point of view and I have a very pessimistic outlook as well. And so that, that's, that's good. I think that's going to nurture a lot of, um, you know, going back to Taz's point, that's going to bring us all together. We're all experiencing those same kind of emotions. Yeah, because I definitely have observed that. Well, myself, it's, I think it's like day to day, the emotions are a different story, um, as well as probably a lot of people are having this conflict between um, the safety of my home and wanting to go outside and be a part of society again and start to enjoy some of the old indulgences of our former lives. So definitely see that duality. Um, I guess I'm also just sticking on the topic of um, where we are as human beings and kind of where we are on this journey. I do want to take a little bit of a of a of a some time to focus on what things we think will stick around for a little bit longer than this current time period. So I want to do that in the form of a game um, called Go Here on. to Stay or Going Away. So it's going to be, I mean, we talked about some of the needs, but I want to think about how that translates to our behaviors and how that it impact retail, I think, in the next coming months and as well as 12 to 18 months away. So in the game of here to stay or going away, um, I'm going to just list off a behavior that we've been observing. Obviously, it's not going to apply to all people, but it's definitely a trend. And when I ask you, you'll basically just answer if you think it's, it's here to stay, meaning beyond late 2020 or going away. And if any of the panelists disagree, then just raise your hand or we can quickly debate as, as to why that is. So it's going to be rapid fire. OK, so we'll start the first one. Taz, ready, Taz? I'm ready. <laughs> Off you go. Okay. Um, so as the behavioral scientist here, uh, lockdown and safety guidelines, do we think that's here to stay or going away? Can I just preface anything I say with a quote from, I think, an American baseball coach called Yogi Berra? He said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, I think I think all of these things are going to be segmented. I think you're going to see a spectrum of different views, as you, as you said. Um, I think people are a lot of people who've been shielding, a lot of people who've been looking after themselves are going to be much more patient. They are going to be much less ready to go out and, and sort of let go of, sort of control and self sort of restrictions that they've had. So again, I think there's gonna be a range of behaviors, but I, I think that could be here for a while. That they will be patient and compliant. I, I think patient compliant is another, I think they're two different things. <laughs> I think there is a, a, great, a number of people who want to be compliant. It might even be an age thing, um, but I think a lot, see a lot of, of COVID people, rage come out of that. Passion. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I think that is a very gradient, gradient, gradient <laughs> spectrum, that one. Um, yeah. And I don't want to get up into the, an age thing because otherwise my children will get angry. So, yeah, right. I also kind of uh, I agree with what I said, uh, but I also feel there's going to be sort of a wave. Um, so this will be a time now where we sort of accepting it more, and it's you know it's fine, and then we kind of gonna go nuts a little bit, and then again accepting, and it's a kind of you know just that duality. What you said, Ian, it just kind of also you know, not only existing in groups of people, but also within a, a period of time until we sort of find that balanced middle where we all happy. And that's something that also, I believe retailers should pay attention to as a sort of almost like a customer research uh, piece of what they need to change so that, you know, wave becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Okay, so Ian, Ooh. ready? Okay. Hands on the buzzer. Yes, reluctant. Yeah. And remember, remember, we have to keep this rapid fire. Okay. Okay, so reluctance to be in public and closed spaces for extended period of time. It's going away. It'll be here for the, the immediate um, as we transition into, into something, but in the long term, that will not be um, part of the new normal. Okay, any disagreement? Can I just take some points away from Ian for saying the new normal? Yeah. <laughs> We okay. can expect that, Taz, definitely. Yeah. I got it away <laughs> early, Taz, Sorry, so I'm just we not, can't say it again, I promise. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Kate. Um, avoidance of or negative association tied to touch. I hope it's going away, <laughs> meaning uh, it very much unfortunately depends on what uh, strategies retailers will use. Um, because if they're going to use what is currently being used, um, you're basically strengthening the avoidance to touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But if you present touch through other senses, and that's possible, there is plenty of uh, cross-modal research that shows how you can indicate um, a perception of touch through scent, sound, uh, or visual uh, mediums, then uh, we will again become a little bit more comfortable in that way for that. Hey, do you think there's going to be some learned behaviors as well? Like touch will come back, but we we won't touch our faces as much. We'll hand sanitize ourselves more frequently. So, you know, learned behaviors will will give us more confidence in that touching realm because I think we're we're all human and we like to touch and browse and poke things. For me, the favorite question, uh, answer to any question is it depends. And that's going to be very much dependent on a person's psyche and uh, their motivations for various things. Uh, and also their ability to, uh, to change their existing behaviors, because some people are less comfortable with changing current routines uh, and rituals that they have. Can I, can I show you something? I don't know whether I can share this on screen, Sandy. I'd like to sort of show you a system one, system two thing on that one, behavioral economics. I'll have a go at showing my... <laughs> my laptop, uh, okay. my, my PowerPoint. Um, I want to show you this. Can you, if you can see that, everybody. Uh, yeah. This is a, a system one approach to um, avoiding touch, getting people to actually realize there are germs everywhere. And I think this is quite an interesting system one um, um, theory or, or principle. The idea being rather than telling people don't touch things, you, you, you physically put these stickers on things and it just creates that sense that unconscious sense that talking to the system one unconsciously of actually every time you're touching something, oh. So I think actually these things can be learned, but I think some of the behavioral science nudges that have been used to do that might be worth, uh, worth examining a little bit more broadly as well. Yeah, I agree completely, Tass. It's, you know, the, the power of subconsciousness is something that has been considerably undervalued yeah. in uh, in design uh, and in experience. Uh, and you know that very well, Ian, you're trying to input that as much as possible into your projects. Uh, and clients sometimes are just reluctant because they don't understand it. But mm -hmm. those that do understand it, it does work really beautifully. And, yeah. you know, I, I had an amazing experience working with Swarovski in precisely the same manner. And Oh my goodness, the amount of little tiny things that you wouldn't even realize that we put it into that store are just absolutely incredible. Uh, it's, it's so easy, but we also have to be very careful to us. I love that solution, but we have to be very careful not to further enhance the fear and anxiety because that also is extremely detrimental to our obedience uh, to behaviors, uh, but also to our overall experience and likelihood of buying. So yeah, there we, needs to be that balance that we need to kind of yeah. find that is telling people what to do in a very intuitive manner, that very kind of subconscious manner, but at the same time, enhancing their experience and creating yeah. and evoking a lot of positive emotions. And, and the examples you used there, sorry to interrupt, Sandy, but the examples you used, Taz, were quite interesting. You had one which was, you know, black and yellow, which kind of evoked fear. And then yeah. you had another one which, which captured wit and play and fun. And so, you know, that delicate balance or that line that we, we want to um, um, walk down in some ways, we, we don't want to go to the fear side. We want to be on that side, which is communicative and fun and engaging and um, in essence, changing the behavior because, because it's done well, right? Not, not the yeah. fear. I mean, I showed that that was from early on in the sort of the pandemic. That was very much sort of creating a social norm around, you know, stay, um, um, stay indoors, stay home, protect the NHS. So it was very much at that stage. You're right. I don't know if we should read anything to the fact that you're, you're wearing yellow, Ian, as well. So I <laughs> stay away. Stay it's, away. It's not black, though. Tal, so we're okay. Stay away from Ian. So. I'm toxic. Right. Very, very well done, Taz. Humor is the breaker of all fear and anxiety. That's what we need more in retail. If we could spend an hour talking about humor, I would, trust me. But I suspect Go so. on, let's do that. All right, let's, let's um, move on to one of the next ones. So we'll do this for, um, for let's, let's go for Ian. Okay, oh ready? Yeah, I'll be quick. <laughs> all right, all right yes. Okay. Man in yellow, all right. Tolerance for suboptimal customer customer experiences. So things like slower retail, longer delivery times, um, obviously queuing, we're seeing that here. Um, 
and streamlining yeah. our choices, right? So this that essentially a reduced, a reduced watered down version of the experience. Yeah, that tolerance will, will go away where we're accepting of it now, but it will not stay. We, we want good things in our lives. We, we have high expectations. Um, I will not accept a store that is not filled with things for me to browse with. I will not accept a long lineup to wait to get into store. I'm okay with it now because I haven't had those things for a long time, but in the long run, um, our tolerance will um, go away and we'll have the same high expectations that were growing um, pre-COVID. Yeah, or even higher. Yeah, yeah, even I'm higher. Complaining again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sandy. I'm saying I'm sure we'll start complaining again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, we won't. Definitely going to come back. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Taz, ready? Yeah. Okay. So this is one trade-off, really, of the desire for hygiene, public health, trumping sustainability. So things like we're actually using more single-use plastics, um, things like that. I Okay, I have a bit of a rant about this because uh, Greta who? Okay, I'm, I'm, slightly, I'm slightly cynical about the whole eco thing. I mean, there is a very, very clear segment of people for whom sustainability and eco and green is important. I, I'm, I'm slightly, as I say, I'm slightly suspicious that that really isn't gonna spread. I, I think I have a little saying, which is ego beats eco. I think for an awful lot of people, how we make, what makes us feel good, what makes us feel that we're in control, what gives us meaning, what makes us happy, what gives us fun, overcomes, I won't use the word trumps, other overcomes the need for the globe and to be sustainable. So I'm, I'm not that sure that sustainability is gonna be a big thing. I think, again, it will, will go back and people will worry a bit about it but I think it's still gonna be about us as individuals. Sorry. And so, and so just to flavor that question, um, not to, okay, so, so I know, okay, I see Kate is disagreeing. Um, so, but just, I wanna, add, I wanna add one component in your response is that if we tie that into other values, right? So buying hmm. based off of um, what they did during the pandemic or um, inclusivity and things like that, that we tie to our values. Um, which in, can include sustainability, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think values, not value, but values. And, and it goes again back to why I started off saying about meaning. I think as long as things are, give us a sense of meaning and belonging and tune into those sorts of emotional system one tribal things, yes. As I say, my only slight cynicism is the extent to which everyone is going to go off and, and, and suddenly save the world. I think there are, there are going to be lots of solutions that are going to be technical, I think, or technological, rather than um, everyone suddenly, you know, saying how wonderfully green they are. So okay. if I'm happy to go, I'm happy to be arch cynicist, cynic, if you want to go and <laughs> oppose that yeah. line. All right, so Kate, you I, um, Yeah, so I on one hand agree with uh, Tas, uh, but on the other hand, precisely what you, Sandy, said is depends how we embroider and uh, envelop uh, the sustainability product or service. So if you look at absolutely any research around sustainable consumption or collaborative consumption, are they... Um, the wanting to save the, the world and the environment is the least motivating factor of purchasing uh, any kind of sustainable products. Everything else that's precisely kind of going back to what you said to us about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, everything else that goes above and especially community intimacy relationships right now, because those ones, those ones were forbidden for us, but we sort of found more meaning from them. If you envelop sustainability in that, then yes. So it's less dependent on what we actually want and more dependent on how uh, a brand will package it. However, there is also really cool research that shows to us, and a lot of it, uh, that uh, when we are faced with existential threats, um, so the principle of mor mortality, salience, and terror management theory, we actually yeah. uh, are much more likely to be more sustainable uh, as well. And there's crazy amounts of research mm -hmm. on that as well, but there is certain tricks within there. There's certain dependencies. So it's not just black and white, yes, kind of face someone with mortal danger and they're going to be more sustainable. No, it doesn't work that way, but there is a way of making us more sustainable. So it's less about in you know in a customer's control more about the brands actually asking themselves um you know 
What kind of impact do I actually want to have in the world? What is my responsibility in this world? And what am I going to do with that? And how am I going to educate or slightly influence my customers to do the good stuff? Uh, and that, unfortunately, like we were talking in our previous kind of pre-chats, that also demands changing of internal structures and uh, the mm. reasons for which um, the boards and directors are getting bonuses, not for just profits, but also for actually making a better impact in this world, because mm. that's why your customers are coming to you, not just because you have a lovely or nice or well-designed or scarce or limited edition product. Mm. Uh, that's the reason why we will be coming in, but you need to package it. Okay, that's great. Um, so just one last, one last example. Um, so Ian, ready? Hands on the buzzers. <laughs> okay, so the last one I'd like to talk about is just um, self-sufficient me. Um, so things like keeping up with new hobbies um, and skills that perhaps we were learning during the pandemic, taking on all of these new hats at home, whether that's chef, teacher, hairstylist for the whole family. Are we going to keep that self-sufficiency up? I, I think we are. I think um, we've all amazed ourselves by the things that we can actually do that we didn't think we could do, you know? And, um, you know, you go back to um, um, uh, Maslow's pyramid, Taz pyramid of, of needs. Um, this this notion of uh, transfer, you know, transformational um, growth. You know, we've all gained a lot of uh, value and meaning from those um, from learning new skills, right? And I think there's a huge opportunity for brands to kind of leverage that in the home, right? There's a huge, there's a whole uh, um, aspect of the of the of the branded experience that can now happen in the home. Right, which has not been explored in any way. Bring back the the, the old Tupperware party, right? And I think um, so. That's going to stay. I think that's going to stay and grow. And we've got too much value out of that, um, not just by the growth that we have, but how we're sharing those with our family as well. So I think there, there's there's so many good aspects um, to that. Not not for everyone, as we've said. This is kind of the general mood. I think we're going to um, have uh, going forward. But yeah, they're going to stay. I'm going to stick with that. I slightly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, tell that to my Coursera course that I'm still on like lesson two. <laughs> um, all right. Um, does anyone else, I guess Kate or Taz, want to chime in or disagree? I wouldn't mind, mind just picking up on what Kate said about, because one of the things I, I'm interested in stories and storytelling and brand character and brand personality. And again, we talked about this before, you know, in the rehearsal. Um, and we, I think we all sort of, again, converged on this point, which is that I think a lot of, of, of retailers, particularly their boards, as Kate said, the higher up people have got to stop seeing everything in terms of transactions. Um, I'm not gonna use the word experience because again, I think that becomes slightly um, cliched and slightly empty. But again, I think we need to look at the sort of the language and the, the tone of voice. I mean, I don't wanna hear about convenience and frictionless and seamlessness. You know, I'm, I'm not a great fan, particularly of, of brand purpose which again, you know, may set another hair running for about an hour. But, but I do want to look at personality and character and lang style and tone of voice. And again, I think some of the, of the retailers and companies that have done well through the pan pandemic have done well because of tone of voice, because they've understood the sort of language, the sort of feeling, the sort of proximity or distance to get with consumers. They haven't done this very transactional parent-child language. And again, I think sometimes governments and companies are very, very bad at doing that. Um, so I think that's a really important thing for retailers to understand. It's not just about their content. It's not just about what they say or what they stock. It's about how they do it. It's the isn't language, that, the design. Isn't that attached to purpose, Taz, though, fundamentally? It's, you know... I, it can not be, exactly. but... Exactly. Um, so what... I, I completely agree with you, Taz. I'm like... One of the absolute first things that I always do with my clients is dig into their brand personality. And more often than not, that demands me creation of an actual fully personalized brand personality questionnaire for them. Uh, yes, using still Jennifer Acker's one and other ones that are out there, but still kind of going there. And I want to stretch farther what you just said. So not just tone of voice, but also design. What has been failing is uh, the very standardized signage and design solutions 
that um, you know that only instill fear and have no kind of branded uh, feeling, no branded characteristics, no branded humor or anything like that. And that you know that's where kind of the biggest issue is because those that kind of really played on it a little bit, then at least they actually got people to pay attention and feel slightly less afraid and maybe just feel as if they can have a game with those signage as opposed to, you know, just follow it blindly because they said so. Um, so it's, you know, it's not exactly as, um, you know, as easy. And going back to what you, Ian, said, uh, on one hand, and I, I agree on the one hand, I don't, in a sense that only those things that we truly found a unique meaning and inspiration of in uh, that we truly discovered that are, for example, the best way to improve our well-being and mental health or to create a better relationship with our children or any other family members, those will stay. The rest is just, a, oh my goodness, that's a hassle to do. I'm sorry, but I'm really missing a hairdresser and a beautician and lots of other things. I'm like, and I'm certainly not going to touch it myself because it's easier for you guys not so easy with this <laughs> i'm like it's really basics i'm like those things that are truly hassle uh, for us they will go back to you know to the people that are professionals in it that's what they trained in those that truly we gain in meaning in such as maybe you know um i don't know spending more time with our children and playing some games or you know uh, or okay, actually, doesn't it kind of taking more uh, beauty routines that we didn't, so really sort of taking care of ourselves and indulging ourselves, or I don't know, writing in a happiness journal or whatever it is, uh, all those things. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to continue baking bread uh, because I don't freaking have the time for it. So it's, you know, we really need to kind of, you know, find what's the trade-off and how much of a value particular activity uh, delivers. And that activity that delivers higher value, yes, can be supported by the brand and yes, can be included as part of an at-home brand experience. But, but Kate, isn't it the fact that we now have that as an option to choose from? You know, oh, four yeah. months ago, we didn't have that as an option really in our in our sphere of things that we liked or could like. You know, now we've tested things, tried things we don't like. We've cast some aside, kept some. And, and for me, it's that kind of that recognize, um, you know, we've now recognized there are things at home I can do. There are things that that I can I can add value to my to my life. Um, whereas before, I'm not sure that was as, as as a big part of our lives now. Yes. Lots won't stick around for sure, but some yes. will. And that option um, now, I have now have an option. I think is the thing I like about it. Yeah, and an option and choice is a manifestation of lack of control. And the more we will be giving control to people in other spheres of our life, the less yeah. we will need to claim that control in those activities. That's my reasoning behind what hmm. I earlier said. Can I, can I just pick out one? Yeah. First of all, um, it's taken us half an hour to talk about baking and having a head um, which I think is a Zoom record. Um, <laughs> no one's mentioned Pilates yet, so I'm just going to say Pilates. Um, I just want to bring up one point, which sort of is a thread. Obviously, I talk about storytelling, we need a thread. So here's a thread that I think is running through. One of the key emotions for me is surprise. Um, it's one of the most basic human instincts, curiosity, surprise. And I think... Ian and I, when we were talking before about design and, and designing that in, I think one of the things that people have found through the lockdown is they found ways to surprise themselves, whether it is doing their own hair, whether it is baking bread. And again, it's something I would urge retailers to think about. How can you, I was going to say bake in, apologies. How can you bake in more surprise? I often use the word serendipity in my, in my second book, The Inspiratorium, which is all about how insight comes about by making new connections. I would definitely advise all retailers to think about how they can encourage people's sense of surprise and curiosity in store, how you guide people, how you perhaps break up the things that they're expecting to see, give it to them, but give it to them in a way that creates that sense of surprise and curiosity. Because I think people are desperate. They're desperate for meaning, they're desperate for happiness, but they're also desperate for a bit of surprise. Yes, that's a great point. And I think that actually ties quite well into let's now start talking about how this is all these changed behaviors, expectations are translating to the actual retail environment that we're seeing. So here, obviously, in the UK, we're um, 
a bit of a, a bit of, of a different timeline than other markets like the US. But um, with that context in mind, based off of what you've seen of as far as the stores that have reopened or businesses that have reopened on a scale of one to 10, um, one being complete disaster and 10 being mind blowing, how would you rate the reopening strategies you've seen re retailers implement? Um, and, and briefly, why? Why is that? So um, if we start with Kate, it has three. Ooh. Taz, what's your number? Um, I think about four or five, four or five, four and, and a half. Okay, so three and, and four and point, four point five and Ian? Two, I'm gonna go with two. Oh, yeah. okay, so, low ball. Okay, four about a three. Harsh, harsh. Mine, mine is like, a, I would say two as well. Um, okay. All right, so I guess, well, it's, you all had very similar low scores. So, um, so Ian, why would, you, why would you have rated them so low? Well, I haven't. I've seen one or two that are that are that are interesting, but they and they touch on what Taz talked about. They've they've actually done some unique things. They've looked at the the situation that's happening and they've responded to those behaviors. Um, but not enough of them. Too many of them think it's business as usual, right? And they've they they haven't rethought exactly how retail fits in anymore. Mm -hmm. And it seems that everything is very tactical, very utilitarian, very functional. It's about getting the doors open and trading and. And I get that, right? It's it is it is where we are in that um, phased approach, right? Like we're going to go through this where people get the doors open and people start getting comfortable, and there will be more understanding of, of what people want of their of their retail stores um, in the future. But I just think there's been so much focus on just getting the doors opening. Um, a little bit around safety, a little around trust, and not around um, really what stores um, provide us, right? They give us a lot of, um, of, of, of really amazing experiences, whether those are social or uh, um, educational or entertainment, like none of that is back in our stores. It seems very controlled and contrived. Everything is around safety, um, not even around uh, trust and confidence, things are around safety, right? And there's a real um, kind of under, underlining um, um, action. And I get it, we wanna, we wanna embed that safety for our customers and, and our staff working there, but um, much more can be done. Me, people think to need to think in a, in a much more uh, dynamic, dynamic way. And so I see too much of the same everywhere. You can't remove, you know, no touch doesn't mean no experience, right? Like if you remove all the products from your store, um, and, and just focus on the customer um, engagement in terms of the human interaction. Maybe that's what people need right now at the moment. But they, if there's nothing to actually do in those stores and just talk to people, well, then will they come back? And so I think there hasn't been a, a lot of thought um, gone into the, the, the longer term impact of delivering a store which is underwhelming. Like, what does it actually mean? People go into a store that is, that is um, underwhelming. Will people come back? Right. And so some of the strategies I like are people not opening their stores because they're not yeah. ready. Right. They actually haven't figured it out yet. So I'm not just about trading and selling you products. I'm about delivering good customer experiences. Right. And those ones that are taking their time thinking about how to do that. Those are the ones I quite I, I find quite interesting. You know, they're very brave, like their shareholders can't can't like that situation where they're not actually trading from from their stores. But I think those taking their time thinking about what's actually needed, thinking about where they want to position retail in the future um, is really kind of exciting. Um, yeah. I so agree with you, Ian. Um, I'm like, um, one thing that I, however, want to pay attention to is we need to empathize with the fact that all of the decision makers are in the same state of fear and anxiety that we've all been living with. Um, and on top of that, they have demand from boards and their directors to sell, 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 because they all also are afraid of losing their jobs and everything else. So the one major thing that I would truly encourage all the leaders to do is to introspect whether the decisions that they're making on uh, creation of that experience and introduction of the safety regulation is purely based uh, on their fear or is purely based on really creating an amazing experience, even if you're not going to sell a lot for the first week or two. Because sales will come back if you're going to have an amazing experience. 
Um, I certainly, one thing that I really liked was Ann Summers decided to open a store a day at the beginning um, to kind of learn from every single store that they were opening to see what else they can do. Um, I liked the fact that Selfridge has decided to have a band, a jazz band for the Cures. I'm not saying it's, um, you know, major thing to do, but bigger than anyone else kind of decided mm. to do. Uh, hey. But I'm certainly extremely proud of my client, um, Dowsing and Reynolds. Uh, and I spent with them purely an hour with the founders on the phone, um, give them ideas, and they truly rolled with it. They have a store in Victoria Quarters in Leeds. And one thing that I really liked was um, that they truly made sure that all of the sort of safety solutions are fully branded, that they fully make sense, including... Uh, their sort of background to all of their brands and their store is uh, is black. So including having black face masks, black hand, uh, black gloves, uh, black uh, hand, um, you know, a soap dispenser for uh, a sanitizer. But we've also introduced uh, various kind of uh, interactive um, aspects using principles from Gestalt psychology. Uh, as well as using their signature moth um, and uh, and also an ability for customers to actually play with the product, uh, obviously that being sanitized before and after that play uh, exists uh, and in including disposable trays. So those are not crazy big and crazy expensive solutions. And yes, might not work for big, uh, um, you know, kind of football brands, but even just kind of branding your signage, uh, as opposed to making it purely fear inducing, that can work uh, majorly. Hey, Kate, that starts I'm to not even Sorry? What you've what you've done there is start to um, by by being considered and adding quality to the by using design to add quality and consider every step, right? You're starting to build confidence and trust, right? And those are just simple things. Rather than fear, you're building confidence, yeah. right? And that that's a subtle shift. But when you use design to add consideration, do be thoughtful. Be thoughtful about it. It's it's not rocket science. Just think about it, right? And, and when you do that, you shift the whole experience away from fear and you start to build confidence. We've got you. We've 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 got you covered, right? That whole notion around confidence and i think it's really nice these just these little interventions can work as long as they're thoughtful and i think like also you know, your brand personality i'm like come on brains view brands as human beings if you wouldn't wear that sticker on your head don't put it on i'm like that's literally how brain works so i think yeah. we're um have just a few minutes so i just want to make sure um i guess just one comment on on kate's on on the silver just I, I was there that week when they opened and I think what stood out as well as like they were trying to create a feeling that was around uplifting your spirit, um, which I think is quite different to, as you said, trying to reassure and, and around safety. Um, so it's, sorry, just one last point on Taz and then um, we'll have one final question. Yeah, I'm just going to show you if I can find this uh, picture, wherever it is. Uh... Where is it now? Da, 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 da. This is um, a, a motorway service station in the UK, um, which was just putting up a sign. Oh, hang on, I've got to share the screen, sorry. Um, this was just putting up a, a sign um, outside. And I, I just like the tone of voice. It's, it's not formal, it's not transactional, it's not parent-child. It's sweet, it's about being kind. It's just about sort of, as I say, being quite informal. It's almost a level of sort of conversational and, and banter. And I don't want to make too much of it. It's only a small thing outside, but, but I think these things matter. And it goes back to something again, that's, that's a thread to all of this, which is stops worrying so much about being transactional and, and didactic. And again, I think, you know, in court talks, it talks about fear, this, this didactic thing about saying to people, you must do this, you must not do that. Just be a little bit more empathetic, be a little bit more supportive and conversational. You've touched on something very essential there, though, Taz, and we probably don't have time to go into this, but um, the retail store as we know it is not going to be transactional. It's not a sales channel anymore, right? It, 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 it is a moment along a pathway to purchase, as there are many moments underpinned by a technological digital platform. But the store as we know it doesn't, doesn't exist. It's no longer where you pick up your goods. Right or pick your goods off a shelf, and this this notion: the sooner people realize that, 
I think the closer we get to, to having much more exciting and engaging, delightful, surprising experiences for that people are craving. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I, I think a lot of I'll just make one last point. Um, and I, I also encourage you to not think like all the solutions you're creating have to be final. Uh, it's all about incremental uh, improvements, constantly going and making it better and better and better for your customers uh, and really sort of, you know, checking it, testing it and going uh, over and over again. I'm like, those things have been already happening. The aspects of flexibility or mobility of, um, you know, of retail concepts, it's not a new thing, but we need to kind of make it even more flexible. Uh, I would love to ask you, my colleague Alice will be sharing on the comment uh, boxes, a survey uh, that will help us with insights for a new tool that we're developing um, that will uh, help to create truly incredible and maintain and sort of incrementally improve um, amazing customer experience in physical retail. So please, as many of you, if you can fill that in, especially if you store director, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I know we have to um, quickly um, wrap up, but um, I, I think we started off with the customer and where they've where they've changed um, some of our new new habits, new behaviors that some will stick around, some will not. Um, I'm thinking about how that translates to the, the customer experience, and I think a lot of it is just really challenging. Um, retailers, brands to um, kind of even just an existential question like why am I here? What What is the role of my store and how can I embed more of the storytelling that Taz is always talking about um, and thinking about how, how you include that element of surprise um, and make things not so transactional and focus on, on safety. So I think we touched on a lot of the points, but we could talk for, I think, two or three more hours on this. Um, we have so many more questions we didn't cover, but um, thank you so much, Kate, Taz, and, and Ian, and we'll just hand it over back to um, PSFK. Um, but thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. To all our speakers, feel free to uh, either leave the Zoom or mute your cameras and mics. Um, up next, we are going to be hearing from Fabrizio Rinaldi from Versace and Val Vacante from Live Area and a founder at Collapse Co. So we hope you join us for that. See you shortly.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next session. Um, excited to have you join us. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what it takes to innovate, some methodologies for exploration, design, and igniting the near future. Um, we're joined by Fabrizio Rinaldi. Uh, Fabrizio oversees digital innovation and growth hacking at Versace, and Valerie Vacante. She is the director of strategy for Live Area and a founder at Collabs Co. And they're going to be in a discussion about what it takes to innovate, again, methodologies for exploration, design, and igniting the near future shopping experience. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Val and Fabrizio. Um, thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ivan. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for the talk, What It Takes to Innovate, Methodologies for Designing, Igniting the Near Future. If we go to the next slide there. There's uh, Fabrizio and myself. <laughs> Jeff kindly did our introductions. So if we move to, to slide three, we really wanted to jump in and get everybody into the mindset of what is innovation? You know, when we think of innovation, we think of kind of rockets <laughs> blasting up in the air, right? Um, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, robots. I mean, Fabrizio, like when you think of innovation, what are the things that people are talking about? I think I think mainly of people and uh, rather than the technology that comes with it, uh, there's a lot of work behind and uh, the synergy and uh, alignment of different stars, if you want to, if you want to say it like that. So there's so much that goes behind it uh, that people don't see. And I think it's a long, long process. I I agree. And I think there's also this kind of uh, interesting mindset too in corporate culture. It's like, is it is it post-its? Is it kind of this innovation theater? You know, like all of these different terms that are buzzing around for innovation. And so if we go to the next slide here, uh, what Fabrizio and I did for everybody is we took this definition of innovation. Um, personally, I really like this definition. It's from Tinde Vicky. He's the author of The Corporate Startup. Um, and what's interesting about this definition here, right, the creation of new products and services that deliver values to customers in a manner that's supported by sustainable and profitable, profitable, excuse me, business models. And I think that's where a lot of companies kind of miss the mark, right? It's always about kind of like, let's come up with something new. Let's be really creative. But oftentimes it's forgetting about where does that ladder up to the business? And Fabrizio, you know, if there's anything you'd like to add, if you're seeing that. I totally agree with you. It's, um, I think one of the main pain points is um, with regards to innovation and uh, deploying, whether it's technology or it's an interesting ad format or it's a creative solution, uh, content. Uh, sometimes they're just gimmicky and they're just uh, not well uh, uh, integrated with the rest of the vision for the brand. So in most cases, they come out of, you know, the result of an agency you work with for the first time who just uh, did a wonderful sales pitch with a very, very competitive offering. Um, but maybe it's a bit detached from what the brand really essence really is. So I think in most of the times we need to make sure especially on a brand side, um, to tie those activations. Again, whether it's, it's marketing or it's uh, technology that we're introducing, that they're part of a story that's uh, way bigger than the single activation. It's not a PR stunt. It has to be something that's coherent. And that comes from uh, actually what we call key pillars in, in the brand essence. So if, uh, if you've got a brand whose essence is not technology, but maybe it's uh, craftsmanship, everything you do has to has to somehow relate to that. And there has to be, uh, in case of craftsmanship, probably a connection with heritage. There has to be a connection with uh, 
touching, smelling, and feeling, and things that definitely are more coherent with that kind of uh, a mission rather than uh, just a single activation using beacons, for instance. So as you said, it's, it has to be coherent and it's not easy. C completely agree. And if we go to the next slide here, um, one of the things that Fabrizio and I did is, you know, when we think about our main, our main topic today, what does it take to innovate? Um, and these are kind of the core pillars that we outlined here. So, you know, kind of building on that last point Fabrizio said about everything laddering up to, you know, that kind of overall mission, you know, company vision, business goals. That's really what we're talking about here. Um, when we say align mission, vision, and business goals, everything should ladder up and be really purposeful. Um, and then when we look at executive sponsorship and investment, you know, again, kind of as Fabrizio said, you know, oftentimes there can be these sort of one-off projects and everything or innovation. It's kind of like, oh, we have some time. Let's have this sort of afterthought and go make something, right? But really where innovation programs are successful is having that executive sponsorship, um, you know, leadership and investment from the top. You know, innovation should be a part of, you know, integrated into the whole business. So There's a story that comes into my mind with regards to that, which is actually really interesting. It has nothing to do with businesses. It's uh, it's mainly got to do with uh, science and um, actually one of the biggest revolution in uh, in physics. Uh, so Newton uh, was uh, basically no one, um, and uh, he actually developed his uh, universal universal law of gravity after stimuli from Edmund Halley, who we know for for the Halley comet. Uh, he actually didn't discover the, the Halley Comet. He, he anticipated that it would have passed after, I think, 75 or 72 years after his death. Um, and um, thanks to the laws that were developed by Newton. And so uh, Newton would have never been able to come up with uh, that revolution and that new concept of the laws that are working in the space we live in are actually applied also in space and between planets and, and so on. And he would have never reached this, uh, this, this achievement without someone that actually sponsored him both on a psychological point of view, so kept him motivated, but also on an economical perspective. Uh, Edmond Alley ended up having to sell a lot of books, basically, uh, that he inherited from um, the Royal Society uh, because there was no way of getting paid uh, just to pursue the task that Newton had. No, it's a good point. And, and when you talk about kind of different thinking, you know, that's a, that brings us to our next point there of that diverse perspectives, right? And I think, you know, it's so important for companies, you know, whether it be in the innovation team, but really in all teams, you know, considering diverse perspectives. Um, I think <laughs> the most successful uh, companies I've seen have been the ones who've gone out and got people who are, have complete, they, maybe they don't have direct experience from what they're doing. You know, they haven't worked at a competitor. They haven't had sort of the, the MBA pedigree, but they've been, you know, kind of a entrepreneurial uh, self-learner, you know, maker, creator, and, you know, having those kind of people in an organization or people from different backgrounds and experiences and really having that diverse team, that's where you get, you know, the most innovation. Um, it's kind of like I tell people, like when you're making a cake, if you just have flour, <laughs> you're going to have flour, but you got to like mix in all the different ingredients and then you, then, then you got dessert, right? <laughs> exactly. I think it, people tend to underestimate this element. Uh, the less diversity there is in an environment, the more likely there is that innovation won't happen. Uh, one interesting stat, which I actually discovered a uh, couple of years back when I went to Japan, is um, Japan has a 2% immigration rate, which compared to Canada, which I think is 21%, is very, very low. This means that there's a really, really low level of um, uh, races mixing up and uh, mindsets mixing up. So the impression we have of Japan, so the huge uh, technological empire of the 80s is actually dying. And the amount of startups that are uh, basically born in Japan is really, really low. There's basically none. In the US, I think 50% of the startups are generated by people that were immigrants. Uh, that gives you an idea of what 
diversity also means in, this, in these terms. So people that come from different environments and can actually bring that added value with a different perspective. So um, it, it is a delicate subject, uh, diversity. But again, it doesn't have to be a gimmick. It's a strategy and it's uh, crucial and it's important. I think so too. And I think just kind of the, really the last point there to reinforce is when we think about, you know, diversity, it's everything from recruitment, right? And being mindful of it and, and open to the type of people and experiences that we're bringing on board. And then it's also in teams, right? So, you know, integrating different, different perspectives, you know, maybe there's, you were talking about craftsmanship earlier, right? So maybe there's someone and, you know, on the weekends, you know, they're building and making, um, you know, their own sort of leather belts or, you know, that handcraftness, right? And then bringing it, that into a group where you might be ideating with new technologies, they're going to have that different, you know, that different maker view, right? Um, and so that's why I think it's really important. It's everything from recruitment, you know, through integrating through the team, and then obviously, you know, growth throughout the organization and having that uh, different perspective all the way to senior leadership. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, and then kind of the next point here I really wanted to, to jump in on was programs, not projects. Um, again, kind of reinforcing that, you know, innovation isn't a project <laughs> or kind of just a one-off experimentation, but that importance of, you know, planning it out, looking at, you know, how, how are we going to keep that ongoing pipeline uh, planned out? How does that align with the products we have already coming out? How is that involved, you know, improving existing products and what's the process for that? So, I mean, Fabrizio, you know, you're, you're kind of living that right now. So if there's anything you want to add to that would be great. Yeah, there's uh, at the moment there's huge changes happening and uh, the need of uh, uh, efficiency is increased because of, of course, the budget restrictions. Um, and so coming up with solutions is even more crucial and more important in a moment like this of crisis. I think uh, there's a couple of elements here that I can bring up. For instance, there's uh, the introduction of uh, NFC technology and RFID technology, which is completely um, revolutionizing the time it takes to track something across the logistics and, uh, and, and uh, the, it's present in store uh or in the um, in the back end of the store um and again these are things that have an impact within one si silo you would think at the beginning but actually when you start talking to the rest of the business you realize how much of an added value it can be also for marketing uh, you know to allow nfc to be tapped and to uh, give additional information to the customer with, regard, with regards to whether the product is authentic or not, for instance, or traceability, so all the sustainability side of things, um, together with uh, CRM and the ability of collecting data uh, after sales with, with the same technology. Uh, again, logistics to track everything, uh, retail to make sure that, you know, you don't have to scan barcodes anymore, but you just uh, must, must, you do massive readings of boxes instead of having to unbox everything. So again, it's finding that technology and or that innovation in general, because it can be software, it can be hardware, or it can be process or people. Uh, and then talking to the business, which is probably connecting to the what we have there uh, as communicate shared learnings, mm -hmm. because constant communication is another element that allows you to connect connected with the other ones before to actually bring added value and create innovation. So again, I have something, I don't keep it for me. I make sure everybody knows what is happening and then ultimately uh, make sure that if anyone can benefit from it, we're, we're, uh, we're also putting that into, into the businesses available. It, yeah, that's a good point. There have been some cases where I've worked in really early innovation um, with design and innovation teams um, with companies with multiple brands, right? And so we might do an experiment with a particular um, technology and maybe it's playing out into different um, stories. And then looking at that and see how that how might that apply to the other brands, you know, within the organization. And instead of just sort of letting everybody fin for themselves, what we would do is really get gather everybody around and just kind of have, um, you know, a, a session and be like, look, this this worked really, really well. 
this was terrible. Um, <laughs> don't do that, right? Um, here's some of the things we learned and really just trying to share, you know, having that shared learning so everybody else can be set up for success. And it's almost like you really want to challenge each other. Like, okay, we, we did this first one. Okay, how is the next one going to be better? Or how are we going to roll this out into um, another line or another collection, right? And I think it also connects with one of the questions we, we, we got from the audience, which is uh, how do you balance the line between innovation and look ahead? innovating to fundamentally change behavior versus looking ahead to prepare the business for 18 months out. A tough problem because of course, if you take it on one direction, you're, you, you have the um, SpaceX kind of revolution, which is, you know, I'm not asking you if you, you know, build, build, uh, build Ford's, um, Harry, sorry, Harry Ford's uh, most famous quote is, if I ask people, one of the most famous, if I ask people what they wanted in the early 900s, they would have asked for faster horse, horses. So on one side, you want to plan for the 18 months, but on the other side, if you want to have a vision that is completely revolutionizing, like SpaceX is having for having to, in, in the idea of uh, reutilizing, uh, reusing the, um, the rockets, they, they, they used to launch uh, things in, in, in outer space to reduce the costs of uh, uh, space exploration, uh, then that's a completely revol revolutionizing uh, idea. And... Uh, I think you can allow, afford that only if you have huge budgets, uh, if you can do research. And R&D isn't something that most brands have available, if not the biggest ones only. Uh, and sometimes I think there was um, uh, an article I read a couple of weeks ago about the fact that most of the innovations and patents that are developed by Apple and Google are actually well balanced between internal and, and uh, uh, freelancers from outside. And so I think there's, um, there's, there's it's, it's hard to plan innovation and it's hard to plan for the very long term in terms of disruption. We should, uh, but if we work practically in our day to day and look at our businesses, in most cases, what people are really interested on of, and I th I'm, I'm absolutely sorry because this is exactly the problem with politics, for instance, is that we're looking at the short term, not the long term. But we are asked, asked normally in terms of objectives to look only at that. So if you think about our appraisals on a yearly basis, they're, they're, they're based on yearly objectives, not on the direction we're going. So most of the times it's, it's the business that's asking the wrong questions. Well, and so two things I'd like to add there. One, you brought up a really good point with KPIs, right? And so that, that is a massive challenge, not only with, um, you know, large, excuse me, large companies, but also small companies. But, you know, where I've seen it so blatant is in the larger companies, right? Marketing has their, their goals, right? Calls, clicks, visits, sales, you know, product has their goals, right? Um, you know, finance has their goals. And so again, planning, you know, making sure you have alignment, making sure, you know, that those, it's like when we're doing these programs, here's the measures of success and kind of having that buy-in through the organization. Um, and then the other part, I, I wanted to jump in on the question here, um, you know, in terms of balancing the line of short-term and long-term, you know, I think the really important part there is having that kind of pipeline of innovation and really planning for that. Like you're not going to have all the answers, right? But if there's an approved budget, there's key goals, there's, there's those KPIs we talked about and marrying them up and kind of showing the progress along the way, that's where you're going to have success. And what I'm, I'm really excited about that question is because that actually segues beautifully into the methodology section. Um, so if we kind of jump ahead to uh, two slides there to our methodologies. So, um, so these right here are, you know, Live Area X are innovation methodologies. And these are really like, these are kind of hot off the press. Um, we've been doing a little bit of testing with these, um, with, again, with different perspectives. Uh, coming in and really looking at the business, really looking at how obviously the climate we're in is changing right now. Um, companies have had to shift their entire business models. We don't have, you know, 18 months, right, to come up with a new product and, 
and figure out, you know, manufacturing and, and, you know, all this stuff that needs to go in the store and what are the new tills going to look like and what, you know, th there's just not that time to do it. You know, we have to act now. And so in designing these methodologies, we really want to keep that in mind. Like, how can we quickly jump in, right, get consumer insights, test them, get team alignment and consensus building, and then rapidly develop prototypes. So um, I'll swiftly jump into these here for a moment. So the first one there, product playground. Um, and really what, excuse me, product playground is, it's, um, it's where we give consumers a particular product and competitors products. Uh, we have done this virtually. Um, we, <laughs> in our experience, in testing these in prior methodologies, they have been in person, but we all of these methodologies, we have been testing and getting great feedback and developing programs. Again, doing that virtually, we would make sure everybody's safe um, and that functionally we're getting the right data out of it. So, uh, so product playground, again, that is where we will ship specific products, competitive products to hand raisers um, to participate. We'll actually have conversations with consumers, so they'll kind of play, tinker um, with those competitive products. Uh, we'll actually have designers or innovation members from the team participating in the discussion. We don't, um, you know, we don't give all of the background of everybody who's there. It's just kind of like as a team and we're having a conversation and we're really looking at how consumers are behaving, you know, from packaging to what is their experience. And then that sounds like regular consumer testing, right? But the difference is we kind of turn it on its head and that we get consumers actually sketching, you know, asking the questions as we're seeing some of the challenges they're experiencing, but getting them sketching and whether it's making one of those products better, whether it's, you know, creating their own product, and really sharing, you know, their thoughts um, and getting people their confidence to sort of sketch out their ideas and talk with us about them. Um, and then basically what we do is we st distill all of those out into a uh, sort of digital whiteboard and then talk through that. We take that information and then use it to inspire and ignite ideas in, in with design and innovation teams. So it's a great input if you're kind of wanting to know okay, we can do all this competitive research, but how are people really behaving? Uh, this is a great way to do it. You can see it's sort of one to two week time frame uh, to get those results. And it's not just sort of it goes into the agency and you get your report. It's we're having those team members in the conversation sort of hands-on um, getting that data firsthand. Um, and, and it's just a lot of fun, really. <laughs> um, the next one here I'm going to jump into is the Ignite Design Sessions. And so what, you know, Ignite Design Sessions are, so that it's really inspired from Design Studio methodology. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but effectively what we, we have our own sort of take and remix of that. But basically, we, we talk with those uh, key stakeholders, and it's not sort of separate stakeholder interviews, rather kind of like a roundtable discussion. You know, find out what's what's working, what's not working in the business, identify a specific, you know, if there's a specific uh, business need or challenge, design challenge, and really creating a persona and brief around that. And then similarly to the, the product playground session, that we had, um, you know, we're getting cross-functional teams. So you may have a person from finance there. You know, you may have a person from marketing, from product, from design, from, you know, everybody. We want those different perspectives and we want to get everybody um, sketching. And basically with this, there are kind of timed exercises and we get everybody sketching, sharing their ideas um, and do that through, you know, a certain amount throughout the day. By the end of the day, we're sort of distill, distill, distill. So I always joke with people that uh, there's going to be a lot of ideas. That doesn't mean they're great ideas. That doesn't mean they're they're you know super stellar ideas. But what it means is it's getting people sketching and then distilling down the best ideas that are going to ladder up to the business. So kind of what Fabrizio was saying earlier on about everything needs to to fit with the mission and the goals and those KPIs, like we're, we're building that uh, together. And then, um, and then really coming out of the session, 
collectively there's consensus building and alignment on, hey, we're gonna go make, you know, we're gonna go prototype rather these sort of three to five ideas um, and then working on an action plan for that. And so again, that's that kind of quick uh, one to two week time frame there. And then kind of lastly rounding it out here um, is the evoke XP rapid realization. And so what that is, is it's really, um, you know, again, a collaborative approach to early product development. So if you've had the Ignite session, it actually feeds really nicely into there because you've kind of determined uh, and aligned on what those prototypes are. So this is basically, you know, working on low fidelity prototypes based on that and also getting some consumer feedback. Um, and what that does, you know, is that helps alleviate, you know, high risk of maybe you want to know about a new technology to invest in. Like Fabrizio is talking about, you know, NFC, RFID being really important. Maybe there's, you know, augmented reality numbers are, are going up at the moment. VR e-commerce are going up at the moment. You know, here's a light way of testing out some of those experiences and prototyping those again before investing really big. And so, uh, you know, these are some of the methodologies that we are, you know, we're currently launching um, right now. And I didn't know Fabrizio, if there was anything you wanted to add or share, because I know you're, you're kind of living in this world of, of having to adjust uh, by the second. Yeah, I mean, the methodologies keep changing anyway. Uh, there isn't one that works and one that doesn't. It's just the one that works in, the, in that specific moment. In, uh, in my experience in, uh, in the, um, coming also from, a, from an agency background, the best creative solutions we came up with in the past, or one of the, the most interesting ones actually, uh, coming out of brainstormings, were actually coming from uh, personal assistants, um, so PAs, rather than creatives themselves. So it, it's an interesting take to yours uh, when you talked about the Ignite sessions, because it's exactly where that diversity we talked about helps bring additional value in terms of a different point of view, seeing problems that we can see, challenges, but also opportunities that you don't see uh, by yourself. And then uh, rapid realization, yes, fast prototyping is something that we use a lot, for instance. Um, uh, one of the most recent one is um, we've developed a technology that allows us to be more efficient in the way we print, uh, so that it reduces 25% of the usage of um, fabric and 15% usage of ink uh, just by printing in a different way and printing only the areas we use instead of wasting everything as uh, we used to do. And that had to go through a process of rapid, rapid prototyping. So we had the idea, the concept, we had to have, we needed a proof of concept. So we found a supplier that actually was willing to invest in the idea um, mm -hmm. because that's another methodology. Uh, finding a partner that's actually willing to believe in it and um, because they know they can get benefit uh, in the long term. And so you do the rapid prototype or the proof of concept for free and you present it to senior stakeholders and then one that is actually approved because you show cost benefits, then it gets into development phase. So that's another the methodology. And again, uh, as I said, it's uh, there isn't one that works and works always. It's just the one that works in the right moment. And so being flexible and knowing what the instruments are based on the teams you've got available. Sometimes you've got to do it by yourself. So there, there's no, there's no brainstorming basically. Uh, other times you've got a lot of people to talk to. So maybe it, it depends on really the context and the budgets and the kind of approach the company has. Cool. If we go to the next slide here, I think this actually ties in nicely again to that question that came up in terms of like, how do you, you know, how do you plan these things out? Because things are always changing. Um, and so this is just an example for you guys to see what we're doing at Live Area at the moment. Um, you know, at the left there, these are kind of different business design challenges. So it could be, again, exploring that competitive product. You know, maybe we do a, a product playground for that, you know, and plan out, okay, we're going to get the results. We're going to talk with, you know, leadership, kind of what, who's the right team, et cetera. Boom, go into Ignite session. Um, you know, here, kind of Fabrizio, as you mentioned, you know, experimenting with new technologies. So we have, you know, we might be experimenting with RFID logistics, right? That I mean, that, that's not going to make sense necessarily to bring a consumer on board, but it does make sense from an Ignite session, you know, again, to your point of having, 
uh, finance or marketing and, and all the different perspectives involved because it's going to be an investment, right? Sure. Um, you can't do that without the store manager, for instance. So um, it has to be a uh, core work. Exactly. And, and then here you can see that these are mapped out. Um, again, this is just kind of a, an example of how you can have that ongoing innovation, test and learn, right? And, and across multiple things. It's not just a, a straight stream of doing one experimentation, but the idea of getting multiple experiments going, right? So you're constantly- Yeah, you, you, you gotta be read. I think what's, that's one of the main points. Uh, you know, out of the many things you, 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 we could say it takes to innovate, I think failure is probably one of those. So you gotta have, you gotta know that you're, you're gonna fall and uh, you're gonna have to step up and keep running and look back and see why did you fall and what can you do to avoid tripping the next time. So uh, failure is gonna be part of the job. Uh, not all businesses are mature enough to accept that and understand that there's an, a test and learn, a continuous test and learn. And people take themselves too seriously. Uh, I think one of the main challenges uh, these days in businesses is exactly that. There's a lot of pressure, of course, to perform, uh, but taking things too seriously probably are counterintuitive and counter-effective because of course it castrates in some way uh, the, the essence of innovation where sometimes you just have to go, go with the flow and um, accept uh, out of 10 things you'll do, probably nine will fail. And then the one you actually manage to accomplish will be revolutionizing. I think that that has to be the approach if you wanna do uh, things in, uh, in in this way. And again, I appreciate you no know, businesses are mature enough to accept that. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in my experience, it's always been uh, an element of uh, beware. Uh, there, there, there is a risk and there's always going to be one. I think that's spot on because um, even when I've had conversations with companies with, you know, with innovation maps and programs, I'm very upfront. I'm like, look, guys, we, to your point, we're making 10 of these, you know, one of them might hit. So just like from the get go, that's the expectation. Like we will not, and I've even said, we will not be making all of these. I'm pretty certain we will not be making all of these because a lot of them are going to fail and a lot of them are going to help spawn other things that we're going to be doing. Right. Um, exactly. and if we, uh, go to the, I just kind of want to jump ahead here to the next section in terms of consumer trends, um, on the, the next slide there. Um, can we check how much time we've got left just so we can uh, coordinate in terms of um, if we need to speed up or anything? I, Perfect, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Okay, wonderful. No, good shout. Um, so in terms of uh, consumer trends, you know, I think now sort of um, uh, in the world of COVID that we're living in at the moment, these experiences here, this was this was like less than six months ago, right? Six months to a year ago. It was all about kind of having that in-store experience, right? Everything from Apple having classes to live music to you can see there with Lush putting things on your face. Oh my gosh, who's going to be doing that now, right? Um, and then in the Nike store, really having that in-store play. Um, similarly with Ikea and you know, um, the examples here, but really, you know, the point here is that, you know, things have changed, companies have adapted, right? Nike brought everybody online. They were getting everybody kind of working out from home, um, breaking down price barriers and getting everybody kind of active. Um, Apple's done a good job of kind of monitoring, you know, what, you know, what areas are having, you know, high uh, COVID impact and closing those stores or doing buy online and pick up in store. Um, uh, Lululemon, we saw with the big acquisition yesterday of Mirror. Uh, I want one of those <laughs> just to kind of get fit in the house. But I think it's, and then also uh, with Ulta and Sephora, you know, experimenting more in the AR space, you know, stopping obviously those in-store makeup sessions that you can see there. So it's been really exciting to see how brands are adapting, you know, in the physical and digital world here. Um, I think the, the, the best point here in terms of uh, takeouts would be, uh, you mentioned AR, VR, uh, what we're talking about, regardless of what the technology is, it's uh, a mixture of physical and digital. And so, again, 
there might be instances in which one doesn't work and the other one does uh, or more appropriate. You know, there might be an instance where to get people, more people to your store, you might do a treasure hunt on TikTok uh, using, using, using AR, uh, sorry, using AR, yeah. Uh, but what really matters, I think, is understanding what the actual objective is, making sure that that implementation is part of a bigger story and a bigger strategy that's got a starting point and an end point in mind. So back to the question about the 18 months and so on, I think having a clear view of where you wanna go is, is very important. And this is, I can think mainly a watch out for marketing guys out there. Um, that most of the times we were pressured to find a creative solution that is nice and uh, enticing for our audience, but then maybe necess not necessarily working for the ultimate goal which in most cases is drive to store has always been drive to store so in, nowadays it's more either drive to store or a drive to e-commerce and so maybe we've got different experiences that start offline that actually drive us to e-commerce and we need to find creative solutions to to make that path happen and then on the opposite side there might be digital experiences that might drive people more into the store when uh, when appropriate maybe just by um, booking your appointment uh, to make sure you're avoiding uh, um, COVID limitations and so on. So again, it's always a mixture of, of the two. And it's not one that's going to over uh, jeopardize the other one. I think it's, uh, it's the ability of uh, mixing and balancing the two in the right way, according to the objective in that moment. I agree. And I think we're seeing, you know, even more so now that that fluidity of being in the physical and digital world, right? It's not just about the purchase, but kind of what happens after the purchase, right? How are we creating, you know, loyalty? How are we, you know, making it really nice? Like, hey, how is that? How is that shirt that you got? Hey, you might like this, you know, how can we kind of anticipate those needs? Um, while, you know, in store making that experience super fast? Uh, but also, you know, being helpful um, with consumers. Exactly. One thing I can think of is, for instance, we're coming from generations before us that, uh, of course, had their experiences completely offline. Mm -hmm. And then we're the first generations that are having them mixed. And then probably in future, who knows how far away, probably not. Uh, they're completely going to be digital, you know, think of uh, Neuralink and uh, the fact that our brains probably are going to be uploaded online and uh, information can be downloaded uh, as quickly as, uh, um, as, as one second. So the point is, maybe in future, when a customer comes into store, he already knows everything about the product. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already like that because, you know, even the purchase funnel in uh, in the automotive industry has changed completely. It used to be seven months before you started thinking of buying a car, understanding what type of car you need, and then uh, filtering it down to what model you want, what brand you want to go with, and then having to test three or four different cars. Now you go directly into the dealership, you already know which car you want to buy. So the whole process is changing, and even the knowledge and preparation and technology that comes to serve that customer has to evolve probably quite quickly in the next couple of years, but definitely at the moment has to be the mixture of the two. Completely agree, completely agree. Um, if we go to the next slide here, we've actually outlined a couple of key points for everyone, um, really just kind of uh, by the numbers. So uh, some of these we touched on just a moment ago, but um, you know, contactless payments you know, kind of growing by 150%. Um, and that was just in one year, That's one year. Um, and then when we look at kind of um, yeah, consumers wanting mobile payments, right? 34% of co consumers want mobile payments. And that's kind of in that post COVID or in COVID world. Um, you know, another thing really important, and Fabrizio, you touched on this a moment ago, as far as people, you know, living in the digital world, being in the physical world, you know, consumers, they want that self-checkout experience. Um, for me personally, I've been at my local grocery store. I want to do self-checkout. Um, I don't want to be in the store for a long time. I don't want to be queuing up, you know, with my, my frozen pizza or whatever, you know, I'm buying. Um, I want to get in. I want to get those things and I want to get out. Um, and even in self checkouts, there's there's still massive queues happening. So what can we do to you know alleviate some of those experiences? Um, 
I mean, again, I think you just stabbed me in the heart with the frozen pizza story. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I said that, I'm like, oh, I know. <laughs> it's Newman's. It goes to a good cause. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's efficient. You, you can warm it up quickly. I understand that. Okay, to that point, uh, we did in kind of the spirit of, you know, staying at home, COVID baking and everything like that. We did make homemade pizza. Uh, my son made one the shape of an egg. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, mine was the shape of the Millennium Falcon with like, you know, some good, good toppings on it. So I like that. I think that makes up for it. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, Cool. And then just some like some other stats here we've, we've carved out, you know, we talked about VR experiences and you know, obviously Fabrizio, the world you're living in, there's there's the um, fitting room process, right? Uh, how are people feeling about trying on clothes? Um, you talked about kind of um, concierges earlier or, or booking appointments. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's so clear here in these numbers, you know, that people are wanting like those VR experiences or wanting those sort of virtual showrooms and wanting to shop virtually. So I'm not sure if there's anything there you want to add. I think there's, well, limitations aside of the moment, historical moment, I think there's, uh, as you said, the willingness from consumers, whether it's B2B or B2C consumers to start spending online and not necessarily physically have to go through the hustle of getting getting into a shopping mall through a crowded space uh even on a psychological perspective it's starting to become something people are not used to anymore so uh the more frictionless the experience is i, I define it like this the better um so in our experience we we're the, we're definitely definitely developing the solutions that are allowing also our b2b consumers uh, clients uh, to actually be able to have a shopping experience that is fully digital, uh, especially nowadays that they can travel. It's, uh, there's just a travel ban; they can't come to our showrooms. So these uh, these solutions are going to be increasing, and probably once they start using it, they can be live without, and probably they won't need to fly here anymore. So we need to plan ahead and get ready for that kind of solution and offer those uh, those kind of solutions. And again, it's uh, it's the industry that's pushing that direction. It's not only the vision of one brand. I think everybody is uh, at the moment developing one way or another virtual showrooms because this is exactly what people need. Well, you're exactly right. And before we before we go ahead, I just wanted to point out that kind of bottom stat there, right? Virtual shopping experiences, you know, reducing returns by 23%. So it's a pretty significant number, right? It's not just it's not just the 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 um, time and management of the garment but also the the staff and everything else that goes with returns so 23 percent reduction rate to have those uh virtual experiences sounds pretty good <laughs> yeah i think one of the main pain points in the past years for e-commerce is returns because of course the standard that's been set up by amazon uh, by the likes of amazon uh, zalando uh and, uh and and all the other farfetch etc they're it, it, it forced the industry to adapt to a standard that's actually not very cost efficient. Um, so the solution there, you can take a uh, quick service and um, and um, returns out, of course, of the equation because consumers wouldn't appreciate that. Uh, the only thing you can do is make uh, the experience more precise uh, in the site selection and giving advices on how uh, the sizes can be chosen and how the actual fit will be and so on. Predicting data based on your height, uh, age, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So using even artificial intelligence to try to make more efficient and more precise the prediction so that the, when the consumer's product arrives at home, he doesn't need to change it. Because otherwise, if we don't find a solution to that, the whole e-commerce might even become unsustainable, only, not only on a sustainable point of view in terms of uh, impact in the environment, because mm -hmm. that's shipping, additional shipping, that's twice as shipping as it would be normally. Um, but also on a, in terms of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of an experience, because of course, when I, when I get something and I want it quickly, I also don't want to give it away and wait another couple of days for it to come back, if it's two days. Completely agree. Um, if we go to the, the next slide here, um, we'll kind of jump into some of the, we call it enabling the future. And so on the next slide, 
um, basically this is so this one here this is one of the one of the real life examples uh, i'm actually working at the moment with the liberia team and this is our design challenge right and, and we kind of touched on this in the conversation a few moments ago um you know when i was sharing my pizza example uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, really, how can we better connect that physical and digital experience, um, you know, alleviate queuing, reduce costs and sales and loyalty, right? That whole consumer experience. Um, so we go to the next slide here. This is what we've been working on. This is uh, this is our product. It's called Live Area Scan and Go. And while there have been um, large companies like Walmart and Sam's Club, you know, experimenting with having an app and having self-checkout experiences, there hasn't been really a way to adopt that to across the specialty stores. And so what, what we've done at Live Area is we've created uh, Live Area Scan and Go, and this is really an extension. We've tested it across three e-commerce platforms, still working uh, on development of the others, but it's basically an app-free, no app required, uh, checkout-free experience. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, if you guys can click the video there. There's no sound. It's just pure demo. It may or may not play for us. We'll see how it goes. Um, let's see here. So we can see the, um, the, he doesn't see the video, so he can play it. The video. Um, that's okay. You guys should reach out to me and I'll show you guys a, a demo of it. Uh, we do we do have um, some working demos at the moment. Unfortunately, now looks like uh, video is not working here online. But uh, but basically what Scan and Go does, uh, you'll receive an SMS message, you know, location based SMS outside of the store, inside the store, welcoming you to the store, you know, letting our consumer know that um, Scan and Go is available to them. Uh, and then from there, um, basically, it's just simple, you know, you register online, you may already be registered if it's a site that you you frequent often, um, quick registration to the site that also you have the ability to opt into the loyalty program uh, as well. And then simply just go through the store and scan the items you want. We've also created a way that say you select a top of some sort, we will say, hey, great top. There might be some trousers, you know, on aisle seven that you might be interested in or in a specific spot in the store. Point is kind of guiding the consumer while they're in store, while they're purchasing a product of something that would actually be relevant to them. Um, if not, you can simply pay there. It gives you your electronic receipt, scan on the way out, um, gives you a very nice thank you, and then also rewards the, the customer um, with that, um, you know, hey, thanks for being loyal, receive $10 off, you know, on your next Scan and Go purchase. So again, really rewarding the customers for using Scan and Go. So not only is it, you know, alleviating um, their time, like the pizza example I shared with you, I'll say it again, <laughs> um, but alleviating their time uh, in the store, but creating, you know, anticipating what they may want, helping them quick, quickly check out, rewarding them for that. And then from a retailer's perspective, you know, obviously that's less hardware, less tills, you know, we need more space in the stores, not uh, less. So, you know, it might be, you know, shifting some of the logistics around in the store to give a little more space to accommodate, you know, social distancing. Um, but we really see this working well. We've been in conversations with um, toy retailers, beauty brands, fashion brands um, already. And so where we're at right now is we're really looking for innovative companies to come, you know, work with us on Scan and Go. Uh, right now, we're looking from a timing perspective, it would take us about two to four weeks to launch a beta. So again, really fast. We're trying to, to move fast. Uh, so launch a beta with a particular, um, with a brand, it would take us two to four weeks. Uh, looking at testing in store, we'd like to do a two to four week test in store. And then on a, on a formal launch, you know, it would just kind of depend on catalog size, um, how personalized you want to get. But relatively quick, we can have any of these specialty stores have the power to, to have that scan and go experience. I think our time is over. Oh, okay. Sadly. Um, cool. I don't know if you had uh, in mind uh, about just a clo uh, closing line or something on your side. 
we have, um, I'm not sure if we can go, I think we had a couple um, more slides <clears throat> there. We had the, yeah. uh, the takeaway, there we go. So yeah, just to wrap it up. Um, so yeah, just kind of wrapping everything up. Again, thank everyone for joining. Thank you Fabrizio for teaming up with me on this. This was a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Uh, I feel like we could keep talking about these topics, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, kind of breaking it down. The takeaway for everyone who's attended today uh, or viewing at a later date, you know, again, aligning, you know, making sure all of those um, everything we're creating innovation programs and they, that they ladder up to that larger mission, strategy, and goals. Uh, having that executive support, sponsorship, and investment. Uh, again, we can't say this enough, including diverse perspectives from recruitment all the way throughout the company and teams, um, designing those programs, not projects. So having that ongoing pipeline, uh, exploring the unknown. So Fabrizio, you talked about this earlier and really kind of experimenting with new technologies um, and partners, you know, right? Who can help you kind of accelerate what you're doing faster. Um, okay. Embracing that hacker culture. Um, creating this pipeline of experiments and then communicating the shared learning. So I wasn't sure if there was anything you wanted to wrap up. <laughs> no, that's it. And be ready to fail. I mean, uh, that's uh, as sad as it might sound. I think it's, it's, it's part of the process. And again, don't take yourself too seriously. I think it's uh, if we don't give uh, an element of fun in what we do, uh, we'd probably do it really badly and we, we would probably be better off doing something else. So, I think these these are two important elements that we shouldn't lose control of because uh, these otherwise would control us and uh, it wouldn't bring us to anywhere. Um, and in terms of uh, if anyone gets wants to get in touch, uh, my contacts are uh, Dude Rinaldi basically on most of social networks such as Instagram and Twitter. And then you can find me as Innovation Waves uh, on my podcast and blog if uh, if you wanna hear more points of view where uh, where I interview, for instance, uh, pro profilers, criminologists, uh, uh, fighters, to get a few insights on uh, on how I can bring back those learnings into business uh, one day. Yeah, when, when we talk about diverse perspectives, uh, Innovation Waves definitely has that. So you guys should check out the, the podcast and some of uh, the readings. And, uh, and I can be reached at Val Vicante on most platforms. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening or start of the day, depending on where you are. Thanks, Val. Thanks, Fabrizio. Much appreciated. Um, those who are tuned in, feel free to uh, tune into the PSFK main stage. You can catch it on Facebook and Twitter if you uh, search Retail Innovation Week. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.